I want to talk about social media. Uh, my name's Richard Harvey. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of East Anglia, which is based in Norwich on the east side of England, where I solve problems in artificial intelligence. And I'm also the uh, worshipful company of te information technologist professor of uh, IT at Gresham College. The worshipful company are uh, a body that does good works in um, the uh, in the city of London, and amongst their their multiple missions is the uh, is the business of educating people as to the benefits of IT. Now, I'm not entirely sure that this lecture is going to talk about the benefits of IT. It's certainly going to talk about IT. And uh, it's the benefits bit that I'm a bit worried about. And when I was planning this lecture, I certainly was not planning to be giving it uh, in the middle of a Christmas election campaign. And it seems inevitable that I there shall therefore have to cover, uh, at least in a small part, some some aspects of the way our current political parties are using social media. I don't have a great desire to do that, um, nor do I have a great desire to reveal to you what my voting habits are, but I will say I am not a member of any political party, and I think if, I me if my memory serves me right, I have voted for every major political party in this country at one time or another, so I, I am not adopting a political position, uh, a, at least a party political position in this talk. So when I started looking at this, you know, most computer scientists want to give lectures which are sort of definitional and axiomatic. You know, so you say, here are the definitions, and from that there are a set of basic theories from which follow all of these interesting consequences. And if you've seen previous lectures by me, that's exactly what I would do. Uh, but I have to tell you that, that social media is, is the Wild West. I mean, it's completely crazy. Um, and uh, you may come out of this lecture even more confused than when you came into it. Uh, and I don't think I make too much of an apology for that. That's, we're right in the middle of a very sort of messy subject with lots of messy science. And you're either a sort of messy science person, in which case you'll be excited and energised by all of this, or you're not, in which case I, I humbly apologise. Let's start with definitions. What is social media? So this is where the problem starts. Uh, there aren't any good definitions of social media. Uh, I scoured the technical literature looking for something that was acceptable to me as a definition, and uh, this isn't really a definition. It's, a, it's an introduction to some uh, legal papers on social media, and they've uh, sort of drawn out some features. I feel a bit guilty about calling this out, really. It was a sort of little side note that the editors wrote when they realised that no one had bothered to define it. Um, the first item is a pure tautology. Uh, Web 2.0, internet, but well, the definition of Web 2.0 is something that uses social media. So it's, a, it's ridiculous, you know. So I, I'm not sort of super impressed with this. If I sort of removed um, some things that I thought perhaps weren't uh, very relevant, we end up probably with um, something along the lines of user generated content and social networks. And I think it's this social networks aspect that I'm going to want to focus on in this lecture. So most people actually leap off in their academic explorations of social media without defining it at all. And what they do is they sort of they write a sort of ultimate paper which goes blah 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 Facebook, blah 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 Twitter, you know, blah blah blah, and then you get into the technology. Um, so here's your trivia question, ladies and gentlemen, and those of you online. Presumably everyone online it can be a watch this since you are watching on social media. Um, everyone recognise all those logos? Oh, there's some shaking heads in the physical audience. Just let me point out. So LinkedIn is a uh, sort of professional social media. It's a bit less abusive than uh, normal social media, although only a little bit. Uh, this is Twitter, OK, much loved by... Um, academics who believe that every word is uh, listened to. Uh, this is, the younger members of the audience must know this one. Insta, yeah, Instagram, yeah, yeah. Uh, you all know this one, this is YouTube. Um, Rumour has it that this is predominantly a male platform and this is predominantly a female platform. Um, not quite true, but maybe so. And this is Facebook, you know, the, the, uh, the Dr. Evil of all, of all the uh, social media. And this one? TikTok, yes, yeah. There's a definite age uh, difference on uh, 
TikTok. Anybody over the age of 30 use TikTok? <laughs> Good, I'm so pleased. The only people over the age of 30 who are using TikTok are paedophiles and other undesirable people. So, uh, because of its age profile. It also has the prize for the worst logo on the planet, I think. It looks absolutely ghastly on your... You, you're convinced that your screen is, is coming apart when you see it because of the red and the green. Now, so um, that said, I would say this is Richard's um, own homegrown definition of social media. I would say these features are the sort of things that you're looking for in uh, social media. The first one is that anyone can join. So that allows me to eliminate social media that's used um, in corporate environments. So th there are a few, you know, things like Yammer, for example, which is a uh, corporate social media platform. Uh, I think we had it at work and tried it for a bit, and it's very boring because there's no insults flying around and no, you know, no rude stuff, so it's not very interesting. Um, this is the feature that we're going to come back to, which is you can publish anything pretty much to, to anyone who will listen to you, it's instant. There are no delays, and this is going to be important as well. And I think this is a key feature as well. There are no intermediaries or censorship. And you, were, you might say, as you think about the way social media works, you might say, well, hang on, there's a bit of intermediary and censorship in some of them. And this definition sort of exposes one of the dilemmas of some of social media companies, which is they would rather like this to be true. You know, they would rather like these things to be true. And as soon as they put other things in the way, they sort of have a sort of big existential question as to whether they're really social media at all. And you can see that in some of the responses from the, the, the big social media chiefs in, uh, in Silicon Valley, the big six, as they're often called. Now, um, it's a telecommunication system, so um, it's governed by something called Metcalfe's law. And uh, Metcalfe's law says that the utility of the system is proportional to the square of the people of the number of people in the system, so number of nodes squared. So that's a very, very powerful sort of utility. And to see how that might work, let's imagine um, this audience might remember something called fax machines. Do you remember fax machines? We were all very excited when we could get them and we could send bits of paper and they got transmitted around the world, and it's very, very exciting. I remember my father coming home saying, we've got a colour fax machine. You know, that's a very exciting. Um, and I said, I wasn't very old at that time, I said, well, who else has got a colour fax machine? And he said, well, you have to have a special one the other end. So I said, well, it's not very useful, then, is it? Because you can only just send it to one person. And that's the basis of the Metcalfe's law. You know, when we've all got one, the utility increases uh, very, very dramatically. So just before we sort of get there, just a couple of sort of buzzwords. But, um, social media's got lots of really fascinating, um, colourful uh, buzzwords, and I'm going to use a few of them, so I thought, I, I thought I'd take a time just to uh, make sure you understand all of these, or we're talking on the same uh, page. Some of them predate social media, so flame, for example, which is a sort of, um, what's a flame? It's, um, it's a counter-argument, often insulting and ad personum, you know, against the person, um, and um, if, if someone flames you, then, and you respond equally rudely, then you've started a flame war, okay? And flame wars can get quite serious. You know, um, there was a famous one, and they're not always about what you might think, so um, they're often about technical issues. There was a fam famous one between the proponents of high-definition DVD and Blu-ray um, on the AV forum, which is one of these public uh, fora for chat about audiovisual things, and it ended, if I remember rightly, in death threats and the police being called. You know, it got a bit out of hand. Um, that's absolutely typical of um, social media. It's well known that when you're online, uh, people are very disinhibited. So they're prepared to say things online that they wouldn't normally say face to face. So um, that's how these, these flame wars can, can happen. Now, trolls, trolls are people who deliberately flame you or start... Uh, trouble, knowing that they're causing trouble. Okay, it's, we're not talking here about people who accidentally insult people. There's nothing worse than accidentally insulting someone, is there? You know, if you're going to insult someone, do it properly and do it to their face. You know, but trolls are really uh, that, that's their their business, and they cause a lot of trouble. Um, 
uh, there's been numerous uh, really sad cases of people having to leave social media because of, of trolling. Um, let me try and think of one. Um, Robin Williams' daughter, shortly after he committed suicide, was forced off uh, Twitter due to quite extraordinarily you know, rude and abusive comments about her father, com completely uncalled for, uh, troll attack. Sock puppets, wonderful phrase, isn't it? Sock puppets, also called meat puppets. Um, a sock puppet is um, someone who is pretending to be something else, usually something um, that they're not. So um, sock puppetry is the business of pretending to be uh, someone else, or speak, flying under false colours, you might call. And astroturfing is, an, is a type of form of sock puppetry uh, where you essentially use fake users to pretend that you've got a groundswell of opinion for something. Uh, it's sometimes used commercially, you know, so you, you pay uh, followers... Um, in order to make you look more realistic. Um, OK, I've got a confession to make, actually. Um, it was my birthday in June, and I wondered what to get myself um, for my birthday present. And uh, one of the things, because Gresham College is on social media, you can look at how many views you'll get for all of your lectures. Sort of competition between the ten uh, Gresham professors. You know, when we have dinner together, we say, oh, I've got a thousand more views than you. you know, and you, you sort of hang your head in shame. And because you're the IT professor, you know that you can't compete with the astronomy. For some reason, everyone's interested in astronomy. You know? And so I thought, well, I'll fix this. I will buy myself some followers. OK? <laughs> Astroturfing, right? So, so I, I went out and bought myself, uh, I think, a thousand followers. Um, for one of my lectures. You can have a look and see if you can work out which one is, which one is spuriously popular. Uh, it might have been 5,000. I'll need to check. It wasn't very much. I think it was, cost me 25 euros. Um, and our social media manager still hasn't spotted it, actually. So uh, there you go. It's a re revelation today. Um, bots are computers that pretend to be users. Memes. Memes are... Uh, they, well, the idea of a meme was thought up by Richard Dawkins, uh, who had this idea of sort of powerful ideas and how they spread across the world. They become trivial ideas, I'm sorry to say. Uh, memes are, are not always the most uh, fancy of ideas, and we'll talk about them uh, in a moment. And sentiment. Sentiment is um, uh, the polarity of a particular... Uh, emotion, generally speaking, whether people feel warmly towards you or negatively towards you, usually on the basis of 140 characters or slightly less. So, you know, what, whatever uh, tweet you're seeing, uh, you look at it and say, oh, yes, people love Gresham College or no, they feel bad about Gresham College. You summarise all of that and then your social media manager, uh, if you have one, sits there looking voraciously at your sentiment. It's like a sort of needle of sentiment, you know, and, and doubtless in this political campaign, there are lots of sort of policy wonks sitting there with square spectacles looking at it saying, oh, our sentiment prime minister is up or down depending on what he's done today. So that segues neatly into sock puppetry. Well, um, we had some sock puppetry. This, this lecture is given in November 2019 and the Conservative Party press office, this is their Twitter handle here, um, decided for the uh, TV debate that we had between the... Uh, uh, the leader of the Labour Party and the leader of the Conservative Party to rebrand themselves as a fact-checking website. Okay, this is a classic example of sock puppetry. Um, it's unequivocally wrong, by the way. I was, I, I was very surprised when they did it. Uh, it happened to me uh, when uh, during the last clearing and confirmation phase of universities. Uh, sorry, not the one that's gone in the one in 2017, I think a well-known British university decided to accidentally sort of attack a number of its competitors. Uh, we all complained. We thought it was a disaster. And the vice-chancellor went online the following day and said, yes, sorry, you know, a teenager got hold of a Twitter feed. I wasn't in charge. It was a disaster. I sacked him, and we apologise. That's certainly what I was expecting the Conservative Party to do the following day. I certainly wasn't expecting them to sort of double down on it and say what a good idea it was. Um, it, it most definitely isn't a good idea. Um, so, there you go, uh, recent sock puppetry. Now, one of the interesting things about these networks is how they propagate information. And this has been, uh, I was going to say, extensively studied. I think I should modify everything I say about social media, the word extensively 
shouldn't be used. Compared to the sort of normal lectures I would give here, when I say extensively studied, I would mean there's perhaps 20 years of solid effort with good data, hard evidence on something. That, that's not true in any social media, but there is, some, there is some quite nice work here comparing the way messages spread in uh, this is... Um, yeah, this is social media spread. Uh, they've used a combination of Google. Uh, you, you, you could use Google search terms to, to uh, measure this. These people are health economists who've looked at this. And what they were interested in was, is it what epidemiologists would call a simple contagion or a complex contagion? So a simple contagion is uh, where um, I infect you with the disease and you've got it. Right? And if you know anything about epidemiology, if I remember, you sort of bin people into three categories, you know, got the disease, haven't got it yet, and recovered. Okay? So that's the sort of model that we're going to use in this lecture for ideas propagating across the internet. You've either, you've either got the idea, or you're infected with the idea, or you... Uh, well, recovery doesn't seem to happen very much, but, um, so let's not worry too much about that. So what they're doing here is they're looking at a couple of memes. And the memes they're looking at are one called Neck Nomination. Does everyone know what Neck Nomination was? Neck Nomination was a uh, drinking challenge. You know, you had to neck it as quickly as possible. Um, and ALS, or the Ice Bucket Challenge. Remember, do you remember the Ice Bucket Challenge? The Ice Bucket Challenge was you persuaded your friends to pour a bucket of freezing cold water over your head and... For some reason, this meant something for charity. I can't remember why it was, but it was very popular, and lots of famous people uh, did it, and it was very popular with the viewers, largely because the biological effects of pouring freezing cold water over your torso, if you're a woman, are marginally erotic if you're a small boy. So uh, <laughs> that was, it was very, very popular. And what they're able to show, these guys, is that mostly um, these memes, as they were called, follow the complex contagion pattern. Um, and the graphs are a bit complicated. What they're, they're looking here at a number of memes uh, taking from Know Your Meme. Uh, planking is people lying straight on the floor. Uh, this one is putting your head in the freezer, which was hilarious at the time. Uh, Mamming, oh yeah, I do remember what this is, and there's a good reason why they haven't illustrated it. It's because it involves uh, parts of the female anatomy being put on desks, if I remember rightly. So they couldn't find a little cartoon for that one. And um, what they found was two things. They found was that the complex contagion model was quite uh, realistic, and that's, that's good to know. And they also found that you could uh, transfer um, uh, models from one of these memes to another. So the thing I would like you to sort of... Um, come away from this segment is that the spread of ideas on a lot of social media is very analogous to the spread of disease. Okay? And of course that is super attractive to if you've got a commercial idea. So if you're going to advertise, you can imagine the, the pound notes that are in people's eyes at the prospect of doing this. You only just need to ping out a really bit of attractive social media and it's going to spread like wildfire across the internet and, and relatively cheaply as well. So behind the tremendous popularity of particularly uh, Twitter and Facebook are huge commercial forces that make it very, very attractive. There's another attraction, of course, which is at least in Facebook's uh, case and Google's case, they will sell you a lot of personal information about the people reading your message. So... You know, that, that has another attraction, which means you can do targeting. But for, for this lecture, let's just think about this spread. That's the important thing. Well, actually, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not wizardry. It's been studied. And um, here's a nice paper that's looked at a rather narrow subset of um, social media. This is Twitter campaigns for motor cars. And what they found was that Pretty much all social media that's effective, commercially effective, is what we're, has these sort of five uh, properties. This is a nice little diagram. So the first one is you, you often use co-branding. So you might say, um, just look at the, not only look at this Ford Mustang, you know, wow, uh, but also look at this Ford Mustang in the Hard Rock Hotel, 
That was a real example. I, I don't know where the Hard Rock Hotel is, but presumably if you're going to buy a Mustang, you're pretty excited by the Hard Rock Hotel as well. So that's, that's an example. Um, if you've got something that people go wow to, and that's hard to define, isn't it? But the example given was uh, Mercedes did a very impressive-looking, sort of freakishly modern uh, truck, and um, no one had seen anything quite like it before, and um, it was uh, quite extraordinarily popular. That's a good trick. Uh, timing is everything, you know, so um, if you can uh, camp on a, uh, a public event. Uh, this has become so popular, actually, that it's now uh, parodied in private eye routinely. You know, um, uh, people will look for almost, the, almost any, any event and desperately try and shoehorn the advantages of their product into this event, even if it's quite extraordinarily tasteless or stupid to do so. So that's, uh, that's been sort of found out, if you like. And this one is um, how many footballs are in this car? You know, that sort of question. So you might run that during the World Cup. You know, it's got, that's got timing. It's got a cognitive task. It interests people. And then this is the only one that's sort of conventional, from conventional advertising theory, which is a campaign. And the idea behind a campaign is you do lots of it in a coordinated way, generally down different channels, and the reason for doing that is it's a complex contagion, so you're just trying to try and get the ideas across everyone's channels, and then they're going to go buy your automobile or buy your ideas. Um, okay, so you've, you've got this sorted. You're, you're now uh, running your campaigns, and you're sort of blatting out across the, the globe down, say, Twitter or Facebook or any one of those social media channels, and it's pretty exciting. You now want to get some feedback from people on what they're thinking about. So the way you do this is sentiment analysis. Now, sentiment analysis is notoriously inaccurate. Um, and sentiment analysis probably is it, quite extraordinarily primitive as well, but let me just sort of try and pick it apart a bit. Um, there are two sort of aspects to sentiment analysis, really. One is emotion, and the other is polarity. So emotion is... Um, Feelings of love or feelings of hate or feelings of companionship. That's the, the type of emotion. And then sentiment is whether you're feeling positive or negative along that direction. Current sentiment analysis is far too primitive to do anything very uh, impressive. This is sort of state-of-the-art um, stuff. This is using a machine learning model. It's, using, uh, it's from um, Christopher Manning, the great text guru. If you're interested in text processing, there's a lecture in the... Gresham College archive, which I gave, about text processing, and this uses a form of uh, vector-space text processing. The thing I would like to draw your attention to, I suppose, a couple of things here. The first one are, these are increasingly complicated words. This n-gram is a segment of a word um, that show negativity, and these are positivity, and these all relate to film reviews. And... Why film reviews? It's actually quite difficult to get hold of data that has free text in it but is associated with a good or a bad. So if you think about product reviews, film reviews, um, what did they train this on? Let me have a look. Um, yeah, they also trained this on something called the Experience Project, which is a... Um, Experience Project is a sort of anonymous confessions. Um, these are quite popular now. There's one... Most universities have one called Uni Confessions, and Uni Confessions is um, it's a blog site where you can post anonymously about what you got up to last night and which you hadn't. Um, uh, it's not a good idea. I mean, it's, it's seriously not a good idea. Um, it's another bad idea that comes from social media. Um, and these are not bad, I would say, you know. But you can see immediately, I think, you know, if, any, if anyone here has a sort of literary bent, that quite classical um, forms are going to be missed by sentiment analysis, and they, they are. So, um, this is a touching and powerful movie. If you're a four-year-old, you know, that isn't a positive remark. It's a negative remark. Might get picked up as positive, yeah, because it's got... Um, was touching and powerful? Yeah, touching and powerful were two simple positive engrams. So, sentiment is, uh, is a problem. So this was the sort of arena into uh, which people were getting pretty excited about sort of four or five years ago. It's a tremendously powerful, democratic uh, medium, and we can measure everything, and it's really good for selling stuff. 
And because it's really good for selling stuff, the companies involved in it have you know, tremendous value. Uh, and even though some of them actually haven't made any money yet, that doesn't matter because we're investors, so we're going to invest in these things because someday they will make some money. So that's the sort of... And into this sort of uh, environment rode a number of sort of rather adventurous bits of science. And one that you might have come across was Google flu trends. So Google had this idea, uh, quite a good idea, I think, that when people were sick, that they would search for terms relating to influenza. So uh, they didn't muck about. They said, well, let's look at the top 50 million queries over a five-year period. Now, that's a staggeringly large number, isn't it? 50 million queries. Uh, you just sort of, by the way, doesn't it? It sort of poses a question, doesn't it? Which was, um, so they record every single query then, do they? Seems like it, doesn't it? So when you type in your query on Google, it gets recorded, right? So this is five years of queries, this is a top for me. And what, you're, what we're going to do is we're going to search through all of those looking for queries that correlate with data available from, in this case, the, uh, the US um, Health Service for... Um, influenza-like illness, physician visits. So we would call that in this country, a physician is a general practitioner. So if you go to the doctor, it gets recorded. And um, it looks pretty impressive. These sort of predictions are pretty well nicely tracking the physical data. And everyone was very excited, and they were very excited, because they published a paper in Nature, which is the premium, uh, it's the top journal in um, well, in the world, really, nature and science probably dominate um, in, in citation indexes across the whole of science. There was only one problem with it, which it was wrong. Um, and um, there's a nice paper telling you why it was wrong. What turned out was the following year, it started to consistently overestimate the flu trends. And in fact, in 2013, uh, Google flu trends was quickly closed because it was obviously rather embarrassing. Um, when people went back to this paper, it turned out that they hadn't published the queries that they'd been using. They had published obfuscated queries. So um, this was a bit strange. I mean, why didn't you publish the queries? Why obfuscate them? Well, you'd only obfuscate something if you thought there was commercial value in it. So it does look very much like this paper was published in the hope of it leading to... Uh, yet more uh, financial uh, gains for uh, one of these companies. And um, what it turned out is they'd done something very simple and naive, which they just overfitted the data. Um, so there's a couple of themes that are emerging here, aren't they? And they're, they're going to turn out to be quite important. The first one is this tremendous sort of ability to spread, which we all knew about social media. But the second one is that a lot of that network isn't available to you and me to analyse at all. It's in commercial hands. So if Google, who have access to all of these search terms, write a paper, well, they can write the paper because they have the search terms, but you can't, because you can't get access to them. In order to get access to them, you need the permission of Google. Right? Very important um, habit, and that's, this is, bedevils the whole of research in this area. It's a very, very challenging um, problem. That said, uh, you know, it's not all doom and gloom and despondency. You can do some nice things. Um, this is one of my uh, favourite ones, which is quite a simple project. Well, um, one of the challenges for Hollywood is to work out what is the sales going to be of the movie in the first weekend. I, I've got, I hope I've got this right. I think Hollywood releases movies on a Thursday, generally, and the idea is that the first weekend is, is actually very important. It's highly indicative of the success of a movie, and, uh, of course, there's a little industry in predicting the success of the movie, you know, based on a whole load of commercial factors which don't work very well. The, the, um, the thing that does work quite well at the moment is the Hollywood Stock Exchange, which is a virtual stock exchange where people essentially trade virtual stocks on the success of a movie. Um, and there have been numerous attempts, I think, to commercialise the Hollywood Stock Exchange, and it's, it's widely regarded. It's beaten by analysing tweets. Just look at the tweet volume around something. Very, very simple uh, measure. Well, they, they do a few more things than just tweet volume, but it is a pretty simple idea. And the Twitter uh, volume, if you like, is quite a good measure 
of success of uh, a movie, which is quite a nice thing. Perhaps not that serious, but perhaps a bit more serious is the idea of trying to work out, in this case, where a typhoon is tracking by looking at the location of Twitter users and watching the tweets track across, in this case, it's the island of Japan, isn't it? So here, this is the real path here, the dotted red one. And let's have a look. This green effort here is a Twitter version. It's not super impressive, but it's roughly in the right direction. This is perhaps a little bit more impressive. This is the uh, earthquake in Japan, and this is an estimation of its centre here. Not bad at all, and done entirely by analysing people's reactions to this. This is not using any geophysical data. It's not using any seismograms. It's just people reacting to things. So Twitter in particular offers this interesting possibility of sort of tracking trends rather quickly and quite positively. And of course, we could take this a little bit um, further. So um, in Instagram, one of the things you can do um, is it's quite common to take a photo on Insta and then apply one of these visual filters to the, uh, to the picture. And um, if you can get access to the users, then you're able to measure how depressed the users are, you know, whether they're suffering from de uh, depression or not. So one of the things they did, and I quite like this as a nice little experiment, was they measured what filters were used as... Uh, a function of whether someone was depressed or not. Okay, quite a big difference, isn't that? Wouldn't you say? So um, this is my dog, uh, Dr. Chasuble is his name, uh, and up up here is um, Dr. Chasuble in Valencia filter. So this is the happy filter, and this is the dark filter. Okay, this is the depressed filter. So this is quite an interesting idea. There's already a number of charities out there that look at people's, with their permission, you know, look at people's Insta and uh, Facebook and social media profiles looking for signs of distress. And the idea is that people might give advanced signs of distress and then you could interact with them. Um, it's really quite a nice idea. It's, um, I think in a previous lecture I talked about a system that was able to detect uh, potential suicides on, on railway tracks. And this is even more powerful because it, it, you hope and you believe it will catch people before they get, to, um, they get to a stage. And I think, I'm fairly sure it was this paper, it might have been the next one. Yeah, I think it was this one that was able to find markers of depression before people knew they were depressed. So in future, your Instagram might say to you, you don't look very well to me. And what, don't you think you should be booking some sort of appointment with your GP? Because it looks to me like you're, you're, uh, you're in a down. Okay? So quite sort, of, uh, quite sort of powerful. This is not really using, I would say, the power of the social network, is it? It's merely capturing people's images. You don't need Instagram to do this analysis. You, you could do it on people's cameras. And if you felt that you were unable to control your emotion, and some people do feel this, then you know why wouldn't you just use a little app that intervenes between your uh, your mobile phone and a sort of mood meter uh, that would that would intervene? And you can go further. Um, so here's a here's an alternative. This is a um, Insta again. Instagram, for those of you who don't know, um, allows you is prim primarily a pictorial medium, but it, you can have some little captions as well. And so these are, I have to be a little bit careful here, they, they, they're obviously looking for um, you know, signs of illegal drug use, prescription drug use, to, uh, excessive tobacco use and alcohol. So it's a bit sort of, um, these things aren't necessarily illegal. You know, it's not illegal to use alcohol and tobacco, not in this country anyway. Um, but they're trying to correlate this with uh, clinical measures of whether you are likely to be an alcohol abuser, for example. So it's not these people aren't proven alcoholics. They are people who show the signs that they might be an alcoholic. So um, they're measuring three things here. Um, 
not sure I've got time to really explain this, but recall is the uh, recall and precision are essentially measures of how errorful you are in your uh, return of um, this this uh, this feature. And as I say, the baseline here is one of these clinical questionnaires where they've been asking people, um, you know, how likely are you to, to abuse alcohol? Um, uh, by which I mean, of course, you know, modern definition of abusing alcohol, not my generation where you know, everybody abuses alcohol. So uh, quite effective, and it's quite easy. What, what, what they were looking for was party scenes, you know, lots of party scenes, lots of empty glasses, and lots of drunken sort of uh, captions. Well, yeah, uh, there's a problem, isn't there? Okay, so we've got some powerful technology which we can apply to some of these streams, and some of that powerful technology might be able to help us. And by the way, this is what this sort of system looks like. Um, those of you who've seen here for the lecture I gave on artificial intelligence might recognize some of these uh, models. They are neural networks, and they're looking at the images here, they're looking at the captions, and they're looking at the comments. These are um, vector space word analyzers. You put it all together and end up with a probability or a prediction for uh, the class. These are incredibly complicated systems, and if you're interested in their complexity, then uh, have a look at the lecture on um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and that sort of picks apart some of these uh, modules. Um, actually, they're quite easy to apply nowadays because most of them are available online and you can click a button and download them and you don't need a lot of, you don't need a sort of super expertise in order to, um, in order to get anywhere with this sort of uh, technology, which is rather attractive. It's one of the sort of attractions of modern AI that you can just download it and use it. It's also one of the problems of modern AI, which is that the sort of people who can download and use it, that's quite a big set of people, the sort of people who actually understand what it's doing that is a smaller subset of the people who can use it. So there's obviously this tremendous potential for misuse. I'm not saying here that this was misused at all. I, I sort of digressed into uh, a separate problem, but it, it gets coupled with the availability of data, as we, as we shall see. Okay, all well and good. So where have we got to? We've got this incredibly powerful set of networks which are self-generating and propagate, can, can propagate ideas very quickly, and people are worried about them. And in a way, that sort of makes, it, makes the situation even more uh, tricky, I think. So um, I think it was Marshall McLuhan who def defined a thing called a moral panic, uh, but it was really Stanley Cohen, the, um, the sociologist, who, who sort of wrote the stages of moral panic. And they look something like this, you know. So there's a step one is we're worried about something. Step two is depiction of it. Step three is concern of the depiction. Four is a response. And then things change. Now, I think he had in mind that the term moral panic implies overreaction, you know, implies a sort of false. Uh, worry about things. I should say that they're almost always, uh, let me take that back, they're often associated now with technology difficulties. So um, let's call those techno panics. And techno panics are quite common and um, they often don't survive um, a sort of cool analysis of the issue. Um, however, and we've got that sort of problem here with social media, I think, that there's a sort of techno panic going on about social media. And the question is, is it real? And if it is real, what really is the nub of the, uh, what really is the nub of a panic? And let me, I'll just sort of muddy the waters a bit before unmuddying them. Um, let me give you an example of a sort of issue. There's a very nice book by, um, uh, Mary Aiken called The Cyber Effect, which I recommend. It's a very good read, uh, and it's very entertaining. Uh, she's a cyber criminologist, I think. So she's an expert on how people commit crime online. So she does a lot of work with law enforcement agencies, and she's a good writer, and it's very enjoyable reading her book. Um, and it, it's, it sort of veers off in a number of directions. And I just picked a couple of her, her, 
inspired by her book, really. They're not all in her book. I just picked a couple of things that people are concerned about. And I wanted to just talk about them briefly because the issue is that they're not all an issue. Um, so let's take screen time as one. So I expect most people are aware that um, parents should be worried about the amount of time their children are spending in front of screens. Don't heard about this? Okay. You should be very worried. If you're grandparents, you should be even more worried. You know, and there are various theories. Your baby is being deprived of its mother's face because the child doesn't get to see you because you're always buried in your mobile phone and uh, eyesight doesn't develop properly because you're always looking at this thing and they're all stuck indoors and not doing anything and all that stuff. You know, and it's all going to be a disaster and you're going to end up as some sort of square-eyed retard who is overweight and not going to do it. And, you know, horrible, horrible uh, prospect. The evidence is very mixed on this. It is quite extraordinarily mixed. And um, there are a number of academics who say it's not a problem at all. And the amount of time people spend on social media and indeed screens is totally negligible. Um, and when you remind people of my age that they spent quite a lot of their youth um, under the bed covers with a torch reading books that really they weren't meant to read at all. Um, and, well, you might look at me and think it did me a lot of damage, but, I mean, it, I don't think it did. Um, and um, I'm pretty sure that my parents were of the... Well, let's not pick on my parents. I'm pretty sure my grandparents were of the view that the amount of television I watched was distinctly unhealthy. Um, well, I'm still here, you know. And so I think there's a very, it's very easy to sort of generate moral panics over these issues... And the problem, of course, is that the data is very difficult to come by. Why is the data difficult to come by? Because it's all in the private domain. And no one is... The, the, the owners of the social networks are hardly likely to give you access to something that could be very damaging to the business model. So it's very contested space, as we would say. So here's another theory. Uh, Dunbar's number. Dunbar... Uh, Dunbar was a, a nice experiment where, um, in ways that I don't have time to explain, worked out how much, uh, what the size of your socialization group could be. And the theory was it's sort of linked to the size of your brain. So primates have slightly smaller brains, so they have smaller socialization groups than we do. So uh, about 150 is said to be the sort of maximum size for your social group. Uh, don't feel too inferior if you don't have 150 friends. You know, I mean, it's not, not the end of the universe. Um, I don't, and uh, after this lecture I'll have even fewer, no doubt, particularly in social media companies. But you know, it's not, not a crisis. But the, the idea is that because you have a social media network that might be hundreds and hundreds of friends, thousands of friends, you cannot possibly service this in your brain. So you're getting some sort of brain damage as a result of having exceeded Dunbar's number. Well, it's all a bit fanciful, isn't it? You know, And um, I'm afraid a lot of commentary on social media, particularly so popular commentary on social media, sort of rather you know, rather sort of focuses on these. In fact, um, there's a quote from the Aiken book when she's talking about how to deal with things. She said, well, it's a good, good policy is to start from the apocalypse, you know, the worst possible thing that could happen, and then work back how to prevent, prevent against it. Well, if we do that, you know, we're in all sorts of trouble, aren't we? Um, it is true that there are slight obsessive... Uh, they're always obsessive people in whatever you're dealing with. Um, and, but it is true that 40% of your everyday speech is roughly concerned with sort of self-discussion, you know, um, self-disclosure. And online, it's, it's more. I'm not sure that's particularly harmful. What I am concerned about, though, so I'm not particularly concerned about some of these sort of faddish concerns, but I think we should be concerned about the propagation of information. And I want to give you an example. Uh, I'm going to play you a video. And um, this is a video you can still find on YouTube. Uh, you might have seen it. Uh, and I'll, I'll play you a fairly good length of it, and then we'll have some commentary on it.
according to research, in order for a culture to maintain itself for more than 25 years, there must be a fertility rate of 2.11 children per family. With anything less, the culture will decline. Historically, no culture has ever reversed a 1.9 fertility rate. A rate of 1.3, impossible to reverse. Because it would take 80 to 100 years to correct itself. And there is no economic model that can sustain a culture during that time. In other words, if two sets of parents each have one child, there are half as many children as parents. If those children have one child, then there are one-fourth as many grandchildren as grandparents. If only a million babies are born in 2006, it's hard to have two million adults enter the workforce in 2026. As the population shrinks, so does the culture. As of 2007, the fertility rate in France was 1.8, England 1.6, Greece 1.3, Germany 1.3 Italy 1.2 Spain 1.1 Across the entire European Union of 31 countries the fertility is a mere 1.38 Historical research tells us these numbers are impossible to reverse In a matter of years Europe as we know it will cease to exist Yet the population of Europe is not declining. Why? Immigration. Islamic immigration. Of all population growth in Europe since 1990, 90% has been Islamic immigration. France, 1.8 children per family. Muslims, 8.1. What? That was the point where I stopped. I thought, 8.1? 8.1? Okay. Uh, four and a half million views of that. Um, here are some of the facts that are in this uh, video. Um, wrong. 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 Uh, wrong. Almost every single fact in that video is wrong. Uh, if you're interested, there's a nice um, BBC uh, Radio 4, more or less, programme which virtually destroys every single fact in that uh, video. And this is, a, this is the concern, I think. This is a sort of misinformation problem with social media. And um, there are some technical solutions to this, but let me try and sort of put it... <coughs> person who puts this rather elegantly um, is Sasha Baron Cohen. And um, I'll just play you a little clip. This is him speaking at the... Uh, Anti-Defamation League um, a few, I think it was literally days ago, and um, it's a long speech, 26 minute long speech, but I'll just play you a short clip from it because I think it sort of gets the nub of a problem very quickly. I believe that it's time for a fundamental rethink of social media and how it spreads hate, conspiracies and lies. Now, last month, however, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook delivered a major speech that, not surprisingly, warned against new laws and regulations on companies like his. Well, some of these arguments are simply, pardon my French, bullshit. Let's count the ways. First, Zuckerberg tried to portray this whole issue as choices around free expression. That is ludicrous. This is not about limiting anyone's free speech. This is about giving people, including some of the most reprehensible people on earth, the biggest platform in history to reach a third of the planet. Freedom of speech is not freedom of reach. Let's just try and think about that. The, um in order to solve this problem, and it isn't solved, and I don't have solutions to it, the, you have to think about social media as this problem of epidemics. And in order to stop an epidemic, you have to think about what you would do to stop 
that epidemic. Imagine you know, you, you've got this problem and somebody's infected in this room. What would you do? Well, the first thing you would do is don't pass on the disease. So if you're going to um, think before you retweet, and preferably don't retweet at all, you know, I mean, please don't repeat. Uh, and I had doubts, actually, as to whether to even include this uh, ludicrous demographics video in this lecture, because I thought I might be giving it some credence. I mean, I hope I'm not giving any credence at all, but just for honest doubt. So don't, don't retweet untruths. Obviously, isolate the infected people. That is a very interesting topic. And what you need to do is you need to sort of punish back those people who have been retweeting untruths. There is some work on this, trust networks. Again, it's very nascent. And um, the reason there isn't much in this lecture about trust networks is because nobody's really doing very much about it. You know, there, there's a little bit of work. It's really not very much interest. Social networks are not very interested in this for obvious reasons. Yeah. The one that I thought we might just think about um, as this lecture comes to a close is this business of immunization. So um, you're all familiar with vaccination and presumably being an intelligent audience, you're not anti-vaxxers. So you all would accept that um, if someone in this audience had measles, then um, that person would be very dangerous if you had not been immunized against measles and they would not be dangerous at all if you had been immunized against measles. So what is the equivalent of immunization? Well, um, I'm just going to skip some work, so I'm going to skip some stuff about trust because trust is easy to deal with. But I am quite interested in this idea of immunization, and um, it has been worked on, actually. Um, oh, dear, can't I find it? Um, never mind. The, uh, there's a group of people working in um, climate change uh, science, and they've been measuring how uh, likely people are to propagate uh, climate change myths before and after education, uh, not only about climate change, but about things. And I think there's a very interesting piece of work here to be done about the ideas that are themselves protective. So, for example, I would say um, knowing about error bars is an example of a protective piece of information. Because if you know about error bars, you know that statistics are likely to be inaccurate. So when you see a statistic, the first thing you think is, well, I wonder how accurate that is. And then you think, well, I wonder how they got that statistic. So there's a wonderful uh, idea here, which is sort of half out of the literature, which is what ideas are protective of themselves against bad ideas. So we need, as a community, to work on that. You'll notice that almost early commentator here are very keen on sort of legal, societal and regulatory approaches. And of course they have a place, and I think it is pretty grotesque that a publisher like Facebook, which reaches a third of the planet, uh, effectively operates on much less regulation than a national broadcaster like ITV. You know, it's just complete madness. So I think that's, that's, this is a problem. You know, the networks are public good, but they are in private hands, and those private hands most certainly are not aligned with the public good. We're in this very strange business that we've got very inaccurate research, highly, um, highly sort of dubious uh, science, which is not a criticism of people doing the science. I mean, that's the nature of early research. And we've got, we're in the middle of a social panic. So the thing I would like to leave you with, which I think is a rather good analysis, and it sort of summarizes everything I've been saying, is this uh, quote from our, our good man, Sasha Baron Cohen, otherwise known as Ali G. Fre freedom of speech is not freedom of reach. Thank you very much. <laughs>